I mean, you talk about a straightforward message. That was Paul. He went right at it. Sin, repentance, or judgment, and the cross, and forgiveness, and heaven. And these guys were saying, see, it's just not effective to just use that. Look, look at the animosity. You're getting a bad name for Christianity. People are thinking Christians are just really a sort of unkind, offensive people, you know. We're, we're, we got to soften that deal down, Paul. And Paul's answer to that is, look, if our gospel is veiled, the reason it's veiled is because the people are perishing. There's nothing wrong with the preacher, and there's nothing wrong with the message, but there's something very wrong with the people. We have contemporary critics today who say, you know, we, we, we can't be offensive now. We've got to, we've got to be more subtle and more clever and... Um, We can't just be going around preaching hell and damnation and judgment and sin and repentance and the cross. And These contemporary critics, by the way, have been very successful, and they have replaced preaching the Word with all kinds of things, haven't they, in the church? Very successful. Roy Clements, who pastors a church in Cambridge, England, writes this, a preacher is a herald, and a herald is precisely a one-way communicator. He does not dialogue. He announces a message he has received. But if our communication experts are correct, announcements do not change anybody. Then Clements asks, where is the flaw in their reasoning? It lies, he says, in their theology. For people who argue like this are assuming, listen to this, that Christian preaching is analogous to a marketing exercise. You have your product, the gospel. You have your consumers, the people, and the preacher is the salesman. It is his job to overcome consumer resistance and persuade people to buy. Well, Clements goes on, according to Paul, there's only one very simple but overwhelming reason why that analogy is not a good one, and it is this, the preacher doesn't overcome consumer resistance. He can't. Consumer resistance is far too large for any preacher to overcome. And then he writes, all the preacher does is to expose that resistance. The preacher, he writes, doesn't save anybody. Evangelism has to be a proclamation, not because it's a, it's a marketing concept, but because preaching is a sacrament of divine sovereignty. It's a great statement. The gospel is not a product. I'm not a salesman, and you're not a consumer. I am a preacher because that's what the Bible tells me to do. I preach the Bible because that's the message I'm given to preach. And there's nothing that I can do in my own power, persuasive power, whatever that power might be, my oratorical ability, the force with which I preach that is in any way, shape, or form going to release you from the bonds of sin. I can't persuade you. I cannot overcome consumer resistance. You know why? You are dead in trespasses and sins, and you are blind. And I can't change any of that. And the natural man understandeth not the things of God. They are foolishness to him. In fact, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish what? Foolishness. I can't do anything about that. I'm just a human being. I can't do anything about that. But you know what I can do? I can surface your consumer resistance. You know, you might not even know you've got it till you get here. And that's how we work it. See, the first part of the service is Clayton. Everybody likes Clayton. Everybody loves the music. Everybody likes it. Then I get up. And what is my job? To overcome consumer resistance? No, to surface it. I want that sinner out there to say to himself, I don't like that, and come to reality about his resistance. Because that's the path of conviction, isn't it? And then the second thing I can do after surfacing the resistance is to present the facts of the gospel. And if the Spirit of God chooses to take 
the conviction of sin and the truth of the gospel and regenerate as a sovereign work, then sacrament, then the sacrament of preaching has fit its purpose. That's what he's saying, and that's exactly right. So you say, what you're telling me is that you want to make a sinner resistant. That's exactly right. Even if you're a Christian, I want you to come here, and I want to say things that are going to make you say, I don't like that. I, why did I come here? I don't like what he just said. And the reason you're saying that is because you don't like the intimidation of the truth against your sin. That's a service that I have to render to you and to me. You think you got it bad? I had to prepare all this. I got to go through all of this a lot more than you do, and then I have to listen to every word I say <laughs> while you're tuning out and in. Don't kid me, I know that. <laughs> the idea that cleverness or the idea that uh, methodology or the idea that technique can break the bonds of sin and bring the sinner to salvation would do nothing but exalt the preacher. You can't save yourself and I can't save you. And I'm not selling you a gos a, the gospel like some salesman who's clever enough at what I sell to get you to buy so much modern evangelism, is built on the heretical idea that anyone, listen to this, that anyone can and will respond to the gospel if it's presented in a clever enough way. And that is not true. That is heresy. The word of the cross is to those who are perishing, what? foolishness, and it always will be foolishness, unless they are the ones being saved by God to whom it is the power of God. And so the, there's a massive theological biblical error at the foundation of contemporary evangelism that misunderstands the whole issue of what is going on. I can't save anybody the greatest orator in the world couldn't save anybody. The most persuasive speaker couldn't save anybody. Only God saves. Go back to Titus 3, 4 to 7. God saved us, it says. Only He can save. All I can do is bring the truth against the sinner so that it surfaces his resistance and he has to deal with that, and then bring the truth of the message of, of uh, righteousness and healing and restoration and all of that so that the Spirit of God can enact that into his life. That's it. All then, listen carefully, that is required of the preacher is clarity. We're not called to persuade people that the clever, innovative speech we give should be followed. We simply persuade them of truth. We just clear, clarify truth, then we stand by and let a sovereign God open blind eyes as He sees fit. And even as a believer, my job is to bring you the truth about any given issue of life so that the Spirit of God can quicken that truth and accomplish in your heart what He will. Now, once I deviate from the truth, I have really convoluted this process, right? If people are being awakened, if they are being saved, then the truth will be the power of God. If they are perishing, it's going to be foolishness to them, and it's going to be veiled, and they're not going to see it. You know what this says? And this is a very important truth. What it says is that it's not the skill of the preacher or the skill of the witness. It's the condition of the hearer, isn't it? People say, well, I don't know if I should witness. I don't know very much. It doesn't matter. Any simple presentation of the gospel that makes the gospel clear, God can use, right? The humblest preacher preaching the humblest message, a one on a one to ten scale, if it is the truth, God will use. And the humblest Christian with the most simple, clear knowledge of the gospel, presenting it to a friend or a relative or someone he or she meets can be used by God mightily as an instrument by which that person is redeemed, because all God requires is the truth. It's not the cleverness of the one who presents it. 